This is chapter 10 on biotechnology. This chapter will provide an overview of five major themes in biotechnology. So we will look at things like recombinant DNA mechanisms found in nature, uh, biotechnology use in criminal forensics, um, how we produce transgenic or genetically modified organisms, um, some analysis of genomes, and applications of biotechnology in medicine. Biotechnology is defined as the use or especially alteration of organisms, cells, or biological molecules to produce food, drugs, or other goods. So basically bio meaning living things, biology, technology, um, generally meaning you know tools that we use to make our lives easier. So biotechnology is essentially the use of some type of organic biological component um, just to make our lives easier, to suit our own purposes. Um, so some traditional applications of biotechnology include using yeast to make bread, uh, beer, and wine, um, as well as the selective breeding of animals. So we can choose which crops we want to plant next year to get higher yields. We can choose which animals to breed to get certain traits that we want to produce in the offspring. Some more modern uses of biotechnology include uh, directly modifying the genes of an organism through genetic engineering. Um, so this is the uh, key tool of genetic engineering is this recombinant DNA. So essentially has um, altered DNA or portions of genes from different organisms that have been recombined um, and put together um, to suit our own purposes. Some plants and animals that express DNA have been modified or derived from other species are referred to as transgenic or genetically modified organisms. So GMOs, um, you may have heard of, just stands for genetically modified organism. Um, so some part of that plant or that animal's DNA has been modified and manipulated by humans um, to yield certain traits that are more desirable. So looking at some natural processes that recombine DNA between organisms or between species. So uh, some of these we've talked about before. Um, so sexual reproduction is a primary way to um, increase genetic diversity by recombining and shuffling genes. Uh, another mechanism is in meiosis um, when we talked about the crossing over and recombination. So in that uh, prophase one, so right before really meiosis takes off and all of the division steps occur, um, when the chromosomes are lined up in close proximity, they're able to just kind of swap some genes and pieces of their chromosomes. Right? So this is called crossing over. So another way that we can get recombinant or recombined DNA um, naturally is through transformation. So transformation is when um, DNA is combined from different bacterial species. Uh, so generally, um, and we've talked about this before as well in previous chapters, that when um, one bacteria encounters some loose DNA fragments, they are able to take up that DNA from the environment um, and then ultimately incorporate that DNA into their own chromosome um, called a plasmid. I mean, so remember we talked about plasmids a little bit in that they are uh, kind of your bonus gene. So they're separate from the main chromosome, the main genetic code. Um, so these would be for things uh, like maybe toxin production, capsule production, things to make a bacteria more, um, more hardy, right, more pathogenic. But ultimately, the end goal is the same. So the bacteria cell is now going to express these new genetic sequences. Another natural mechanism for getting recombinant DNA is through virus transfer. So viruses are capable of transferring DNA between species. Um, so remember we talked about um, what constitutes a living thing. So viruses are in that kind of gray area of biology where they're not 
they don't meet all the criteria to be considered a living thing, but they still you know, play a role and interact with organic material. So viruses essentially are basically genetic material that is encased in a protein coat right, or a protein package. Um, so when they're not infecting a cell, they're pretty much inert, just like a, a rock. They don't do anything. They have to interact with the living cell to be able to reproduce. Um, so a general cycle of virus infection. So the virus has to make contact with the cell. Um, so it will attach to the cell surface. So not all viruses can infect all cells. So it's kind of a specific lock and key type mechanism where only certain viruses can infect certain species. Right? So this is why dogs don't get measles like humans can and a lot of other viruses. Um, but it is possible, as we know, that viruses can jump species. Um, and this is when they become particularly more lethal than they would otherwise. Um, but after attachment, the virus will inject its DNA into the bacteria. Um, and the bacteria will then replicate that viral DNA instead of its own. So essentially viruses kind of hack into the cell's metabolic machinery because they don't have their own ribosomes and organelles to make protein. So they hack into the cell's machinery to make these viral proteins and these viral uh, genetic sequences. Um, so synthesis, we're making new protein coats and then assembly. So we're putting all the pieces of the new viruses together. So ultimately um, the virus load will reach a maximum threshold and the cell will rupture, releasing these new virus particles. But occasionally when viral transfer occurs um, during this packaging process, maybe some of the host cell DNA gets inadvertently packaged in one of these new viruses. So then the new recombined virus goes to infect another cell um, and the cycle would continue. So this is a figure showing how this genetic recombination through viral transfer can occur. Um, so again, the virus will attach to a susceptible host cell. So it has to be that specific receptor um, on the cell. Um, the virus enters the cell, hacks into the DNA of the host cell, um, and tricks the cell essentially into making viral proteins instead of its own DNA proteins. So now we have some pieces of the host cell DNA shown in blue that has been kind of accidentally included in this new recombinant virus. So when we're packaging the viruses, maybe a little bit of the original host DNA got added to there as well. So then once the host cell bursts, it's going to release these newly assembled viruses um, so now this recombinant virus can infect a second cell and transfer those genes between different species. So again, most viruses infect specific host species or have a very narrow host range of types of organisms they can infect. So like bacteria viruses can infect humans. Um, a lot of dog viruses can infect humans and human viruses generally can infect dogs. Um, but it is possible that they can move that host DNA between fairly um, or closely related species. So some viruses can infect multiple species, as we know. Um, so this gene transfer between viruses um, usually results in extremely lethal recombined viruses. So they have kind of um, this hybridization um, of pathogenicity. So as we know, current uh, with the coronavirus, COVID-19, right, is thought to have jumped from bats to pangolins. This is a pangolin. It's kind of like a scaly anteater, uh, but jumped from bats to pangolins and then to humans. So that's just the leading theory. It's not been confirmed. Of course, more research has to be done, uh, but it is kind of interesting to think about. So bats are usually natural reservoirs um, or sources of these coronaviruses. So the SARS virus from about 10 years ago um, was originated from bats. Um, so bats really have super strong immune systems. So they're able to carry these these lethal pathogenic viruses um, without being sick themselves. Um, and now in some countries and places around the world where they humans interact with these bats and these wild animals, um, and especially places like uh, wet markets where they have lots of exotic 
animals or dead animals that in nature would not be that close to one another. So in nature, these viruses wouldn't have the opportunity to interact and jump between these species. So really kind of boils down to the humans uh, bringing these different species together and giving these viruses an opportunity to jump um, and cause these widespread pandemics. So biotechnology has a wide range of applications and those applications are going to vary depending on who's using it and what their goals are. Um, but one of kind of the foundation uh, biotechnology mechanisms is the PCR or polymerase chain reaction. Um, so polymerase chain reaction works to amplify a DNA sample. Um, so we can produce virtually unlimited copies of a very small sample. So when you do these reactions and tests on DNA, you really need lots of copies of the DNA to spare. Um, so if you only start out with just a couple of copies, PCR is a good way to kind of build up your base of sample material. Um, so PCR run is basically DNA replication in a little tiny test tube. So you basically put the ingredients for DNA. So you have some of your enzymes, your nucleotides, remember those basic building blocks of DNA, um, and put it in the machine. So this figure shows basically how PCR run works. So we have our original double-stranded DNA segment. Um, so we put our ingredients in the tube, we put it in the machine. The machine is then going to heat up our DNA strands enough to break those hydrogen bonds and separate the two DNA strands. So then after that, we have a cooling process and we add the, uh, or we allow the primers in the DNA polymerase, so the enzyme that's going to add the primers, add the uh, nucleotides. So then after that, we have our new DNA strands beginning to be synthesized and copied. So these are shown in the yellow. So the red and the blue were our original parent strands. The yellow are your new, newly synthesized DNA strands. So remember, DNA replication is semi-conservative. Right, so meaning that we have one old strand and one new strand. PCR can give us virtually unlimited copies of a DNA segment um, because it doubles in every cycle. Right? So it has an exponential growth. So we start out with just one DNA strand. So one becomes two. Right? We run another cycle. Two becomes four. We run another cycle. Two, or those four become eight. And then 16 and on and on until we get a good enough sample that we have plenty to work with. Another common uh, biotechnology use is gel electrophoresis for separating DNA segments. So essentially you can have mixtures of different DNA fragments, different genes, um, and we can separate those based on their size. So some genes have more base pairs, have more letters in them than others. So we can maybe separate the larger genes from the smaller genes. Um, so gel electrophoresis is the te technically used to spread out these DNA fragments of uh, different lengths in a mixture. So essentially we would start with your DNA sample and add um, certain enzymes to it that are going to cut the DNA up into smaller segments and cut the genes out. Um, so then we add our mixture to the well or the base of the gel. Um, and these DNA fragments are negatively charged, right? So remember they have a negative charge. So electro Foresis, so meaning electricity, we're going to apply a power source, electricity, to this gel um, with a positive charge at the end of the, the plate and the negative charge at the top of the plate. So being that our fragments are um, negatively charged, they're going to be kind of naturally drawn and pulled toward the end of the gel toward that positive charge. Right? So remember, opposites attract. So 
as these molecules, these DNA fragments, are traveling through this polymer, this gel um, matrix, um, <clears throat> so the longer fragments are going to get kind of stuck. So they're going to be slower to travel through this gel, this sludge, right? So they're going to be closer to the top of the plate. Your shortest fragments, the smallest fragments, since they are smaller, they're going to be able to travel faster through this gel matrix, this gel plate. Um, so they'll be near the bottom of our wells. Another commonly used biotechnology tool are DNA probes. So DNA probes are used to detect and find specific genetic sequences. So these are good for um, diagnosing certain genetic diseases. Um, so things that we know the actual genetic sequence for, so we can engineer a DNA probe, um, which is a single stranded sequence that would be complementary. So that meaning um, it would base pair up with our known region of DNA such as the allele or the gene for cystic fibrosis. So these DNA probes would then be labeled with a fluorescent tag. So that way they will kind of light up or give us the signal. Um, we're able to detect that it is a positive match for our gene of interest. Right, so in this figure, we're looking for cystic fibrosis um, allele. So that's a well-known, well-studied genetic disorder. So we know the actual sequence of bases for that gene. So if someone has that particular sequence of bases would mean that they have that disease. So we engineer our probe or um, to have a complementary sequence to the gene of interest, so to the cystic fibrosis allele. If the person has the gene, so they have the disorder, then our probe will be able to find and attach to that sequence and light up giving us the signal. If the patient does not have the disorder, there would be nothing for the probe to bind to, so we would get a negative result. Some other interesting applications of biotechnology include forensic DNA phenotyping. Um, so this is used more in you know, the criminal justice area, forensics, um, for aiding in the search of criminals and victims. So if we have a good sample of DNA, we can look at certain genes, alleles, and traits for maybe things like hair color, eye color, um, ethnicity, um, to get a pretty good profile of what someone may look like. So this figure is showing um, our genetic phenotyping. We had for um, an individual. Um, so this is what the computer came up with, with what she may look like. And this is the actual person or right, her actual photo. So it's pretty close, not exact, right, but it is still right, very recognizable. Um, we can also use this DNA phenotyping to get a better idea of what our ancestors may have looked like. So Neanderthals and ancient humans, we can find DNA and get an idea of what maybe their facial features um, and certain traits would have looked like. Um, the FDA also uses DNA phenotyping to kind of um, authenticate certain food items. So the fish you're buying at the store could be labeled, you know, whatever, but how are you really going to know that's what you're getting? Um, so we can run genetic tests on um, meats at the grocery store. So in this example, the store was selling this as tuna for $8.50 a pound. Right? Um, when the genetic ID, we run the forensics, it's actually a tilapia that's worth way less. These techniques of PCR, gel electrophoresis, and identifying gene, uh, DNA sequences with DNA probes have applications beyond forensic science. So biotechnology can be used to modify, isolate, and modify genes. So we can either combine genes from different organisms, or we could transfer genes from one species to another. Um, so probably one of the most widespread and longest um, form of biotechnology has just been selective breeding. So humans have been practicing biotechnology and genetically engineering um, organisms, crops, and animals since the dawn of time. Right? So if you're a farmer, you're going to save the seeds from your best producing plants. Right? You're not going to plant 
uh, replant the seeds from the crops that didn't do so well. So you're only going to plant the ones that you want to produce next season. All right, so same thing with animals. We can manipulate their traits and select which ones get to reproduce, essentially which traits get to persist and which traits would disappear. Um, so in the 1700s, farmers started experimenting with crossbreeding plants within a species. Um, and then in the last century or so, it's really taken off um, with plants as well as animals. Um, so the 1990s was really when we had our first GMO, so a lot earlier than you may think. So biotechnology genetic modification of crops has been going on for pretty much as long as humans have been around. <clears throat> So we've been talking about genetically modified organisms. So how do you make a genetically modified organism? So there's three major steps involved. So one, we have to obtain the desired genes. We have to isolate the gene that we want to focus on and manipulate. Um, then we need to clone the gene. So we need to make lots of copies of the gene. Um, so if we were to kind of individually obtain the desired gene from multiple cells or chromosomes, it would be very labor intensive. So we have kind of a shortcut that we can use to make many, many copies of a gene in a relatively short period of time. Um, so once we have enough of our sample, we can then insert that gene into cells of another organism. So in isolating the desired gene, we have to cut that gene out or snip that gene out using what are called restriction enzymes. So these are basically enzymes that target specific genetic sequences and then cut or remove those genes and those sequences from the chromosome. Right, so we add our restriction enzymes, going to cut the DNA into smaller fragments and pieces. Um, so now we need to separate our gene of interest out of this sample of lots of fragments. So that would be where we use our gel electrophoresis. Okay, so remember these fragments are negatively charged. So we add our mixture of DNA fragments at the end, we apply an electrical current. So the negative charged DNA is going to be drawn toward the positively charged um, voltage at the end of the plate. Um, so the larger DNA fragments are just going to move slower through that gel. The smaller fragments can move more quickly and would be found near uh, or closer to the bottom of the plate. All right, so now we can isolate and obtain our specific gene that we wanted. All right, so once we have our um, desired gene, we would insert it into a recombinant plasmid of bacteria. So remember, the plasmids were those bonus genes. They're separate from the main chromosome, so these are fairly easy to manipulate without affecting the overall structure and function of the cell itself. Right, so we can basically trick the bacteria into um, making copies of our gene for us. Right, so as the bacteria multiply um, exponential growth, they grow very rapidly, um, they're also going to be making copies of our desired recombined DNA segment, right, our plasmid. So then we can later, once we have enough bacteria colonies grown, we can extract all of these plasmids and our multiple copies of this gene and then insert it into another cell or organism. So again, the most common method for cloning DNA is to use bacterial plasmids. So bacteria can multiply very rapidly, and these plasmids being that they are separate from the main chromosome, um, we can manipulate these without affecting the overall cell's function. All right, so this is showing we've inserted a gene from an animal cell, right? so maybe the gene for insulin right, from a human cell that we insert into a bacterial plasmid. So we put this plasmid back into a bacteria cell and just let the bacteria do its bacteria thing. So the bacteria is going to get nutrients, it's going to grow, and then it's going to divide. So before it can divide, right, it has to make copies of its DNA. So when it's making copies of DNA, it's also making copies of our gene.
So at this point, we can um, actually have two options on how we want to collect or harvest this gene. So if we're only interested in getting copies of the gene to insert in another cell or do something else with later, um, we can just remove the plasmids and the genes from there. However, if we want the um, actual product of that gene, so maybe we want insulin. We don't just want copies of the insulin gene, but we want actual insulin proteins. Um, so then we can just have the bacteria um, in their normal bacteria life and um, express this insulin gene. So they'll start producing human insulin proteins that we can then just harvest the product at the end of the process. So this is how modern human insulin is obtained. So before we came up with this method, um, the old way to get human insulin was to harvest it from the pancreases of sheep and pigs. So as you can imagine, it would be very messy, very labor intensive and very expensive um, to get that type of insulin. So this is actual human insulin right? that we can get very cheaply um, and mass produced in a lab. which also can make you kind of angry about the current price of insulin for patients. But anyway, so we said restriction enzymes are what we're going to use to cut these genetic sequences out of the chromosomes. So restriction enzymes are specific for certain nucleotide sequences. So restriction enzymes are only going to se seek out and destroy essentially certain genes or genetic sequences in the chromosome. So this is showing our DNA segment, including our gene to be cloned, shown in blue. Um, so then the restriction enzyme will cut just at the ends of the yellow section. Right? So this is the gene we don't want. So we have all of our blue gene included, um, and we've made it so that it will fit in complementary base pair. So the ends, the little yellow ends here, will stick in base pair with the ends of the plasmid. So it's going to cut the plasmid and the, um, the gene to be cloned at the same regions. So then we can just kind of replace what we snipped out of the plasmid with our gene to be cloned, our blue gene. Right, so now we have a recombined plasmid. Um, and same thing when we talked about uh, DNA replication. At the end of the process, DNA ligase is going to tie these ends together and right, form a ligature to bond the genes into the plasmids. So then at this point, we have a recombined plasmid that we could reinsert into a bacteria and then just kind of sit back, let the bacteria grow, make copies of that plasmid or express that gene and produce that protein product for us. Another way we can get our recombined gene into a new host cell is through transfection. Um, so this is more for if we're inserting recombined DNA into a eukaryotic cell. Um, so transfection essentially is kind of injecting or shooting the uh, new gene or recombined gene into the cell. Um, so one method of that is through uh, vectors like viruses. So viruses are able to, as we said, transfer genes between organisms and species. Um, so we can engineer viruses to basically be um, right, the UPS guy to deliver this gene to our cells. Um, another mechanism would be a gene gun, which is literally exactly what it sounds like. So we have some particles, things um, like heavy metal particles that we coat with our recombined DNA. Um, so then we put it in a gun and it literally shoots into the cell. Um, so now giving our new DNA a chance to interact with the host cell's DNA and hopefully recombine. So this is more common with your plant cells because remember they have that thick cellulose cell wall. So we just need a little bit more oomph to get the DNA particles um, across that barrier. Um, and then finally, another mechanism could just be direct injection. So this is most common in your animal cells. Um, so this is a picture of in vitro fertilization. So we have the, the DNA or the sperm from the father that we are literally just micro injecting into the female's egg cell.
So far we've talked about how do you make a genetically modified organism. So now let's look at how do we use some of these transgenic or genetically modified organisms. Um, so naturally they're most widely used probably in agriculture and biomedical research. Um, so we have developed certain GM organisms to help control insect-borne diseases. Uh, we can clean up mine waste, oil spills, help repopulate forests. Um, a big thing, a uh, point of research now is looking at algae to make biofuels. So algae are photosynthetic, meaning they're solar powered. So it's pretty much a virtually unlimited source of energy that we are trying to be able to harness that would be revolutionary if we can just crack that code. Right. Um, but this figure is showing, so 93% of uh, our soy in the United States is genetically modified. Virtually over 90% of all crops, every fruit and vegetable that you buy at the grocery store has been genetically modified in one way or another. So even if they say they're organic or they're non-GMO, they've been genetically modified throughout human history from their natural source. Um, so people are still kind of iffy on GMOs. There's not a, a lot of knowledge about them since they are so new, um, but they are pretty widespread. We've just been kind of under our noses this whole time. We're just now starting to pay attention. Uh, but it's estimated that by 2050, the world will have to produce 70% more food. So billions, tons of cereals, grains, rices to keep up with population growth. Um, so one of the um, revolutionary outcomes of biotechnology and genetic engineering has been golden rice. So we've genetically engineered just basic run-of-the-mill rice to make it more nutrient dense, more heavy in certain vitamins and minerals for certain countries that maybe don't have access to lots of food. So that way they're not being so malnourished. They're still getting lots of vitamins from this rice that they are able to harvest. Yeah, so according to U.S. Department of Agriculture, USDA, 93% of corn, 90%, 96% of cotton, 94% of soybeans are all transgenic. Right? So like I said, virtually every fruit and vegetable that you see in the grocery store is genetically modified in one way or another. So one tool of biotechnology that we've used when modifying some of these plants is to have some built-in um, insecticide or pest resistance and herbicide resistance. Um, so classic example is the Bt gene, um, which comes from a bacteria. Um, so this gene in the bacteria uh, produces a protein that is harmful to the pests, right? So to this corn borer uh, worm. Um, so we have inserted this worm killing gene from bacteria into our crops. So now if a worm tries to eat the plant, it's essentially going to be eating that protein produced um, that toxin produced by the bacteria and kill the worm. Right? So it's also beneficial because it targets the digestive system of the insects, but it doesn't affect the digestive system of mammals. Um, so this figure is showing a crop that was not treated versus a crop that was treated. So you see the crop on the left was pretty much wiped out by these pests. Um, another interesting application is using genetically modified plants to produce medicines. Um, so in theory, we can insert genes um, into plant cells and then eat the plant cells and um, develop immunity. So have kind of a vaccine that you can eat. Right? Um, so say we take a gene from a human pathogen, um, insert it into a bacteria that infects plants. Right? So then we essentially put this gene into the plant cells, which would then produce those uh, pathogen proteins, right? So vaccines pretty much are just enough or small pieces of a pathogen, just enough to trigger your immune system to make antibodies against it, right? So we can have the plant kind of trick our immune system into thinking that it's eating this pathogen or it's encountering this pathogen and make those antibodies for us. So transgenic animals can also be engineered by incorporating genes into the chromosome of a fertilized egg and then allow that egg to just grow to term and develop. Um, so common example application. So we have taken the fluorescent 
gene from one organism and inserted it into mice eggs. And then we let those eggs grow. And now we have glow in the dark rats. Um, another interesting application, um, Kevlar is what they make bulletproof vests out of. Um, so spider silk is kind of an important component of making that Kevlar. Spider silk is one of the most durable, hardest, um, strongest substances known on earth. Um, but it's kind of hard to milk silk from a spider, right? It'd be a very long, tedious process, I would imagine. So what they have done is taken the gene that codes for making the silk protein. So that's really all it is, is a protein. So all proteins are genes. So we find that silk gene. Um, we insert it into a goat egg, right? We let that goat grow. Um, and ultimately, when that goat pr uh, reproduces, the si uh, spider silk proteins can be found in the goat milk. So it would be much easier to harvest in much larger quantities of that desirable product, the silk, um, than traditional methods. Um, same thing we do with getting some um, proteins and things like uh, blood clotting factors um, through genetic engineering. So say someone has hemophilia, which could be a genetic disorder. So we take um, the gene that produces the certain blood clotting factor from the human inserted into the plasmid. Um, we have our recombined plasmid that we then insert into the sheep egg and allow those genes to recombine with the sheep's chromosomes. So then we have our transgenic sheep um, that will produce those human blood clotting protein factors in its milk. So genetically modified organisms may also be useful for environmental bioengineering. Um, so in things like mosquito control, pest populations. Um, so we have engineered a bacteria found in the mosquito that carries malaria. Um, so the bacteria can secrete a toxin that kills the malaria in the mosquito. So then the mosquito is ultimately never able to pass on that malaria parasite to a human host. Um, another thing that we have um, been working on is um, essentially eliminating mosquitoes altogether. So we have um, developed essentially or genetically modified mosquitoes to be sterile, right? So they're unable to reproduce um, or they have the sterile gene. So over time, the population density will die down because they're reproducing less and dying off more. So normally in biology, ecology, they say that every species has a role to play, you know, in the food chain, the food web. Um, so there's this delicate balance we have to maintain. So we have to save all the species. Well, as a biologist, I can say that mosquitoes, we could wipe them out completely and it would not affect the ecosystem one bit in a negative sense. So that's just my opinion. So how is biotechnology used to learn about genomes of humans and other organisms? So everyone's probably heard of the Human Genome Product uh, Project by now, um, launched in the early 90s with the goal set out to map the entire human genome. So what we've learned from the Human Genome product, uh, Project is that we have about 20,000 human genes that make up a human being. Um, but these 20,000 genes only make up about 2% of our total DNA. So we have lots and lots of DNA, um, but it looks like really only 2% actually code for usable protein. Um, so the other 98% consist of things like promoters. Um, so we talked about promoters before um, in uh, gene expression chapter. It's just the start point of a gene, so the enzymes know where the gene begins. Um, but it's not really known what most of our DNA does. So it's considered kind of junk DNA, maybe lots and lots of evolutionary baggage. So even though we have evolved from more ancient species, right, we still share genes with those species. But that doesn't mean that we express all of those genes, right? So our ancestors would have had fur and tails. Right, so we obviously don't have fur and tails, but we do still carry the genes for those traits in our chromosomes. Right, so that would make up some of that 98% of non-expressed or unusable DNA. So 
why was the Human Genome Project undertaken? So we really wanted to improve the understanding of our genome. Um, uh, had a major medical impact. Right? So lots of human diseases that are genetic have now been identified and we can use genetic testing to diagnose these sooner. So again, back to like the cystic fibrosis, right? where now we can use simple DNA probes to search and um, alert us if that gene is present. Okay? Um, so molecular tests, genetic uh, screenings, preventant of disease, Right, therapeutic uh, applications, right, so it has a, a wide-ranging impact on the healthcare industry. Um, so another example of kind of a outcome of the Human Genome Project, we learned some of the genes that are involved in breast cancer. Um, so it was uh, pretty well known a few years ago that the actress Angelina Jolie um, kind of brought genetic testing to the public's attention. So she had kind of a preventative double mastectomy after finding out that she did have the allele or the gene for breast cancer. Um, and her mother having died from the same uh, disease, right, she wanted to be proactive in her health and go ahead right, and not take the chance of developing the cancer. Right? So biotechnology has come a long way in uh, kind of these preventative measures as well, preventing cancers and certain disorders. Um, so we can use it to diagnose inherited disorders, even in fetuses. So even still in the womb, we can uh, do genetic testing. So two most common procedures are an amniocentesis, where we take a sample of the amniotic fluid, um, which would contain some cells from the baby that we can then test its DNA. Uh, a chorionic villus sampling is where we take a sample of the actual placenta, um, which would also contain fetal cells that we can test the DNA for certain um, genetic disorders. So different alleles are going to bind to different DNA probes. Remember, the DNA probes are specific, so they kind of seek and destroy or seek and find certain genetic sequences. Um, so an expanded version of a DNA analysis or DNA probe analysis is called a microarray. So essentially, we just have thousands of probes um, on the same sample. So we can test for a variety of known disease-related alleles um, kind of at the same time. We can also use this to help diagnose diseases by bacteria or viruses, so um, like the flu test or um, the COVID-19 test. So when they do that swab, so we have kind of mapped out the genetic sequence of these viruses, um, so we can make a probe that would target just those specific sequences. So if that sequence is present, the probe would attach and light up and give us the positive test result. Uh, we can also help produce medicines using this technology. So we already talked about human insulin. Um, so nowadays it's produced very inexpensively in a lab by bacteria very rapidly um, for diabetic patients. Um, some other hormones um, and things we can produce, things like growth hormone, those clotting factors, all use this same kind of process of uh, recombinant DNA plasmid technology with bacteria. Gene therapy is a relatively new kind of venture of biotechnology. So this would seek to actually cure diseases by inserting, deleting, or altering the genes in a adult or living patient cell. So the theory is we would remove the cells from the patient right? um, and then use a virus as a vector to deliver our gene of interest. So say they have a defective gene, so they don't make, um, so say sickle cell for anemia. Um, for example. Um, so they don't make hemoglobin properly. So their hemoglobin gene is defective. So we can take their cells, insert the correct hemoglobin gene into a virus, and then infect those cells with the virus. So the virus is essentially just going to inject that DNA into the patient cells, causing it to interact and recombine with their DNA and hopefully replace that defective gene. So then we would take the corrected cells with the right gene and reinsert back into the patient where then they would hopefully replicate uh, and the patient would start making the proper proteins. So modern 
Biotechnology offers the promise of greatly changing our lives and the lives of many other organisms on Earth. Um, so two important issues must be explored, though. So the use of genetically modified organisms in agriculture or environmental bioengineering. Um, and then ultimately, we'll have to face the prospects for genetically modifying human beings. So when you think about it, Pandora's box has already been open, right? So there is no going back from this point. So now it's just kind uh, trying to kind of regulate ourselves um, and how far we want to take this technology. So should genetically modified organisms be permitted? Um, so the goal of breeding or genetically modifying these plants and animals is to make them more productive, more efficient, more useful for our own human needs. Um, so these genetic modifications um, are going to differ from our traditional biotechnology of selective breeding. So selective breeding was, you know, the ancient method of just, you know, setting aside which seeds you wanted to plant next year, only letting certain um, animals reproduce and breed uh, for the next generation. So genetic engineering is much more rapid um, and it's able to transfer genes between species, whereas traditional biotechnology, right, we're still operating within the same species. Um, so now genetic engineering, we can create entirely new hybrid organisms. Um, so Ultimately, we have the capability to produce new genes that have never been seen before on Earth. So a few pros and cons to these applications. So pros, we don't have to use as many pesticides. So we can engineer these crops to just be naturally resistant to the pesticides or, um, or the pests. Um, we can make them more nutrient dense, make more nutritious food, like with the golden rice. We can increase the food supply so we can make sure that these crops are producing more yield per season. Um, we can make them more tolerant to drought, especially important with climate change. You never know. So the rains could come, they could go. We need plants that can tolerate these changes in climate and keep up. Um, longer shelf life um, and disease fighting foods. Some cons, so we are also kind of on the other side of the coin, increasing pesticide resistance. So these, um, in the example of the toxin produced by bacteria that killed the worms and the cotton. So evolution eventually says that those worms are going to evolve and adapt a resistance to that toxin. It may not be anytime soon, but we've already seen this happen with bacteria and antibiotic resistance. Um, so leading into decreased antibiotic um, efficacy, efficiency. <laughs> um, so gene transfer into the wild. Um, and really, this is all new. So we don't have uh, really long term studies on some of these organisms, some of these gene recombinations. Um, and generally just a poor track record in the biotech industry because it is a very lucrative industry. There's lots of money involved. So whenever you have lots of money involved, there's probably lots of shady characters in the background. Um, increased herbicide use. Right. So again, going back to these, um, these weeds are going to adapt to our herbicides and our um, our genetic engineering, so we'll have to use more herbicide in the long run. So common question is, are GMO foods dangerous to eat? So a lot of foods are advertised as GMO free, or, you know, we don't have any GMOs. Really, in most cases, there's no reason to worry about eating a genetically modified food. Like I've already said, everything is already genetically modified to some degree. Um, and if you think about it, when you eat foods, your digestive system is going to break down those nucleic acids, those genes in the chromosomes that have been modified into their basic building blocks of the nucleotides for the most part. So are GMOs hazardous to the environment? Um, so the environmental effects of GMOs are more debatable than maybe some of the nutritional um, effects. So again, those BT crops enable farmers to reduce the amount of pesticides, which means less pollution. Right? Um, but there are some 
potential downsides to these genetically engineered crops. Right? So um, one example would be competition with natural species. So if we engineer these crops or these organisms to grow faster, to grow stronger, um, they're going to have kind of an unfair competitive advantage against the native organisms that are the natural organisms in that habitat. Um, so this could lead to things like invasive species um, if they spread into new habitats, which could kind of wreak havoc on certain um, ecological areas. Um, so thinking about if genetically modified fish could reduce biodiversity in the wild population if they escape. So again, with that selective advantage, they could kind of outcompete the natural fish for food and resources um, and quickly replace that wild population. So one way to try to avoid this would be to create a sterile organism that cannot reproduce. So we make these genetically modified organisms. Um, worst case scenario, they get out of the lab or whatever, um, but at least they can't reproduce. So we don't have to worry about them kind of out competing um, and taking over the natural resources and population. Um, so one ethical issue of biotechnology to think about um, is meat production. So our current rate of meat consumption in the world is not sustainable. Um, so cattle farming makes up a large percentage of all the deforestation in the Amazon um, and around the world and farming um, just because they require so much land uh, per cattle, um, so much grass, so much greenery. Um, so one thing that's contributing 60% of deforestation in the rainforest is called uh, slash and burn agriculture. So what they do is they'll slash um, all the, uh, the trees and the plants from one section of the rainforest to make a cattle ranch. They'll have the cattle come in, um, eat their grass, um, grow for a generation or two, and then once they've completed, uh, completely kind of depleted that area um, and basically ruined the soil, then they move on to the next section where they'll slash the rainforest down and make new, uh, new cattle ranches. Um, so one thing to think about with biotechnology going forward in the future is lab-grown meat. So I know when I say lab-grown meat, people you know, kind of freak out. Um, but if you think about it, meat, when you eat meat from an animal, it is nothing really except mainly muscle tissue, some connective tissue, right? Um, and that's basically it. So we know the ingredients of muscle tissue and connective tissue. So in theory, why can't we just take the genes or the cells from a cow's muscle and just grow them in a lab environment? Um, so of course, they would grow them under tension to kind of bulk them up, right? make the muscle fibers more bulky, more meaty. Um, but once you grind or mince the muscle tissue, it's going to come out the same way as ground beef. So they're still working on it, but this is definitely going to have to be um, seriously considered in the future if our current rates of meat consumption are going to continue. And finally, one of the last ethical issues to consider with biotechnology is should the genome of humans be changed by this biotechnology? So we've been talking about genetically modifying bacteria and plants and animals, um, but what about humans? So in theory, we should be able to do the same type of genetic modification to humans that we do to these other organisms. Um, so some of these implications include things like, should parents be allowed to select genomes of their offspring? Right. Um, so really already we are doing this. So in in vitro fertilization, they do genetically test the embryos before implantation. So if they find um, an embryo has a certain um, gene for a disease or a defective um, gene, right, they would just not choose that embryo to be implanted. That embryo would essentially be discarded. Um, so. In implications like that, I guess it seems like it's OK because it's already happening. But how far do we want to take this technology? Would it be ethical to change the human genome? Um, so should parents be allowed to choose um, when if they want a child with Down syndrome or not, as well as do they want a child with green eyes or blue eyes? So where, 
where do you draw that line um, on how we're going to kind of do artificial selection now on humans, right? Like we've done with plants and animals. Um, so in, on one side of the coin with this technology, we could ultimately completely eradicate genetic diseases after a few generations. Um, but again, where is the line? Right. So this example, we have some parents that have a genetic disease they know of. So um, they have their embryo that has the genetic defect. So we can insert a proper gene or a healthy gene into that viral vector to kind of replace the defective gene. Right. So now we have a corrected cell um, that they would then clone and ultimately make a healthy baby. So we just kind of replace the defective allele in that cell. Um, so there's an interesting movie about this concept called Gattaca. Um, so while we all have some downtime in quarantine, uh, maybe find it on Netflix or Hulu. Um, but it kind of deals with this whole concept. So there is um, ultimately biotechnology has taken over where the higher class of people now have all of the good genes. So if you haven't been genetically modified, you're kind of looked down upon um, and seen as a lesser than human. Um, but it is really interesting, really good movie. Highly recommend that you check it out if you get the chance.